Okay, thank you. Um, so my talk today reports some uh, work in progress, uh, definitely not finished. Um, but my main uh, goal is to tell you about something that I think very few people in the VM community know about and that could be very useful and significant in um, achieving high performance in VMs and it also has other applications to debugging and such. Uh, so it's really just to kind of raise awareness of this thing that I stumbled across last summer. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about tracing as it is as an abstract context, as an abstract uh, technique, then talk about this new facility that's available now, uh, practical issues with that and applications within uh, particularly the Graal VM context that we are working on. But there are many other applications uh, to other areas and you know, catch me afterwards uh, if you want to hear about those and, and talk about those at another moment for our lawyers. This is exactly the same statement he showed so I've seen at that time. <laughs> okay, so what is tracing? Let me just make it clear exactly what I mean by that. So here's a trivial little uh, C program that has a loop in it. Uh, what I mean by taking the trace is that I compile that into machine code and it doesn't matter if you can't read the actual instructions. I'll point out anything that's silly. Then when I run the program, I have uh, in my head the program counter of the, the C program. Uh, in reality, there's a program counter in the machine uh, pointing to the uh, ins current instruction being executed. As, as I execute, I log the program counter values into a trace. And that's all the trace is. It's a single linear list of pro machine level program counter values from the execution of uh, a program. And if you have a multi-threaded program, every thread has its own trace. And the only relations between the traces of independent threads are when they fork, when they join. Uh, other than that, there's really no connection. Uh, and I've avoided the multiple loops so you don't have to suffer through all of that. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a trace. Um, the uh, important, um, important aspect now is that you can do this at relatively low overhead. Before that, we used to have to be able to take traces only by emulation or binary translation or some other technique which had you know, order or orders of magnitude overhead. And so it was not something that you could do in production. Now we have this new facility in Intel processors called Intel Processor to Trace. And just out of curiosity, if you heard about this facility before this talk, please uh, raise your hand. Better because Mario well, told me. <laughs> lower your hand if you heard it from me. <laughs> okay. so, um, so this is the thing that surprised me. This has been in two generations of Intel processors, and as far as I can tell, software people, system level programmers, uh, I've not heard about this at all. Uh, and I kind of, you know, uh, when I read the description of this on an Intel blog post last uh, summer, you know, I practically spat my coffee across the monitor because <laughs> it's like, how could this possibly not have got out there? What's the motivation then? Uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, so, the, um, what this does is um, it's a hardware mechanism. Uh, here's a little sketch of how it works to try and explain it. It's a hundred pages of the Intel manual, perhaps the most boring text in, in creation. Um, so I'm giving you this, this picture and the, the next one to try and explain exactly what it does to you from reading that. Basically you have core, the core obviously contains some program counter, Intel calls them IP, but I was trying to call them PC, so that's what it's going to be on my pictures. And then there's a piece of hardware on the chip that's uh, a trace recording piece of hardware. It reads the program counter and it gets other control signals as your program is executing. You have a set of uh, registers that you can use to configure this hardware and turn it on and off and, and various parameters I will describe. And when it's turned on, uh, a, having configured it, you've put a buffer in memory and it writes into this memory uh, packets, and each packet basically describes one or more control flow events in your program. Um, so the idea is that when you turn this on, you get this trace recorded in this buffer, and you can use this buffer to reconstruct the history of your program in the form I showed on the previous slide, which is as a sequence of IP addresses. Notice that it's, all it's logging is control flow information. It's not, there are no data values in this. You're not, it's not a back in time debugger. You can't go back and look at the values in memory or registers. All you get is a record 
of the control flow of, of a particular thread running on a particular core. So, uh, some in, other important facts. Uh, this mechanism writes directly into memory. It does so using the, it's basically configured to write into physical memory. So it's not going through the caches, this data not polluting your caches, not disturbing your caches, it's not disturbing the TLBs in your system. So it has, uh, given what it's trying to do, uh, the minimum amount of um, disruption to the program that's being monitored. That said, uh, for a typical program, the bandwidth to memory that this is writing is on the order of 50 to 500 megabytes a second, depending on your program code. So it's taking you know, some amount of memory bandwidth to store this, and that's going to have some performance effect on your program. Now, 500 megabytes a second sounds like a lot, maybe, but the typical DDR4 or 5 DRAM bandwidth is, is tens of gigabytes a second. So it's not a massive fraction of the raw hardware bandwidth that's available. And uh, you can see this uh, in the performance overheads. When, uh, when you run something like the C program that I showed you, uh, more loops than 10, uh, you know, millions of iterations, you get a typical overhead, a slowdown of maybe 2% in the running of that program. Uh, the biggest program we have managed to log a trace for in its entirety is uh, the Graal VM running JavaScript, running the Richards benchmark, um, which is about five seconds of execution, and that writes 1.6 gigabytes of trace data. Now, the challenge with these kind of data bandwidths is you can't, there isn't a disk, right, that will keep up with that on a laptop or even on a reasonable desktop. So you can't write the stuff out to, to secondary storage. All you can do is put it in memory and process it in memory. Uh, or run, run a short enough program that the entire trace is all in memory. So that's one of the drawbacks of this approach. Uh, the other thing I should say is that the overheads that range 2 to 7% uh, is probably not the worst case and we haven't spent any time really try and explore where the worst case is, but I think you could probably get higher slowdowns than that if you really tried. Mario, can you um, configure it? Like, is this configure box telling the trace what events you're interested in, so you can... No, it's a control okay. flow trace. You get so the get control everything. flow trace. There's no way to... You can either, you, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the options, but okay. it's, it's a control flow trace. You okay. either have it all or none. Okay. Okay. But when you have none of the control flow trace, you can get some other information as well. I'll say mm -hmm. a little bit about that. So here's an example, that's the same code as before. When I start tracing this, um, here's the trace as, um, as I listed it, and next to that I'm gonna put the records that get written into memory by this particular mechanism. So the first thing it does is it's, it, and every once in a while, it will emit something that says you were here, an address, that's called a flow update pointer, and it just records uh, where the program counter was, and when you turn it on, it issues one of these, so you know where the trace starts. After that then, it's silent as we run through this program. Note that even as we execute, this is a jump instruction, which is jumping over the, the, the uh, increment in the loop, so the, the way the loop has been ordered, it, the increment is at the top, and you jump over it into the body, which does the test, and then goes back to the increment. And even this jump does not emit a record because uh, the principle of the design of this mechanism is it only emits data that you could not infer by inspection of the binary. So if you were doing an abstract interpretation of this binary, you would know that that jump was going to be taken, so it doesn't tell you that. Uh, it only emits data, so we're working through, when we get to this conditional branch at the bottom here. This is a taken branch, so it writes out into memory that this branch was taken, and that can be recorded asymptotically in one bit, right, you take them or not take them. You, you must have reached this branch, you need only one bit to tell whether you got there. There's a small amount of encoding overhead in the packets that are written out, but asymptotically it gets fairly close to one bit, and so on. So I've allied in most of the execution here. The only other interesting thing I want to point out to this, uh, so we're, when we're falling up the bottom of the loop, I've elided the iterations in between, we get a not taken bit right now, and then when we get to the return, there's an option. This is one of the, th this is one of the things you can configure. Um, when you execute returns, 
if you're, you have a same ABI, you can infer the return from the previous call, the matching call, right, and the trace. If that's the case, then you don't really need to be told the target address because it's inferable. But you may have a situation where uh, you want to know that because the distance is long or the hardware couldn't keep up. And in that case, you can, you can uh, basically configure it to write the target address of every return. That's one of the configurable options. Okay. To there. Okay, so we've got now this record in memory which we're going to process and uh, the record in memory just logs those conditional branches and uh, uh, not much more. How do we reconstruct a trace from those? Well, what we have to do is we take the, um, the packets in memory, we take our application binary, there's some additional OS metadata that I'll talk about in a, in a little while that makes this a complete system. And then we have to run in software, a decoder, that will read this and look at the binary, infer the various um, uh, branches that were taken, and uh, write out the reconstructed control plan. Mario, does it record interrupts? I'm sorry? Does it record interrupts? Yes. Uh, so if you take an asynchronous event, it, record, it emits a different record for that. So well, if you have um, an interrupt or uh, an exception, you know, you do a divide by zero or you try and dereference a null pointer, it will write out the source address of that, so where you were when that happened, and the target address of where you went to. Right. It looks like the ideal information for trace compilation, because they really want to get a, a linear stream of, of yes, operations. Yes, indeed, indeed. And you could Indeed. So, so with this, you can you can um, you can reproduce um, the all of the, the complete history of a program flow in the presence of interrupts, exceptions, and all of that. Um, okay. So, luckily, this 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 process is is non-trivial to try and do a full reconstruction. But luckily, Intel has open sourced a, a decoding library that does this for you. Uh, the library can operate at several different levels. You can either say, just please tell me what the stream of packets were and decode the packets, and I'll do the rest. Or you can have it uh, tell you the basic block headers uh, of your program as in the trace log. Or you can have it basically call back and give you each instruction one at a time with its program counter at some level of decoding. Now, the, the bad news is if you do that, the um, more detail you get, the slower the decoding goes. So, so how's the decoding work? <coughs> Here's the program again. Here's the trace we got as recorded in the trace buffer. How do we reconstruct the actual series of uh, traces? You know, the floor update pointer tells us where we started. We start stepping through these instructions, uh, step following the jump, which isn't recorded, until we get down to the, the conditional branch here. And now, because we know there's a conditional branch, we now know we take the next uh, record off the top of the trace. Uh, we know the target address from the instruction, and we know that the next place we went to was the target of that branch, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, if you do that in the full level of detail, um, asking for every PC one at a time, the standard library um, is decoding every single instruction as you step through them. And it, it, it takes about 1,500 times longer to decode a trace than it did to run it. So this is not good from the point of view of online analysis, because you run a program, you get some data, you know, and you're spending a massive amount of CPU time doing the decoding. Now that's, uh, we, we think that can be mitigated by basically caching some results. Um, you know, you don't need to decode every instruction over and over again. You can cache some some data and do it yourself, and make things faster. So, hopefully, that's given you enough of a flavour of the mechanism that I've provided a lot of detail here. So, um, in the interest of time, so ask me if you want to know more. I'll tell a little bit about the context we're trying to apply it in in an optimizing virtual machine. So, we have the Graal VM, which is Graal Truffle running on top of Hotspot. Um, performance is kind of the key driver of the design. We want to make things run quickly. And um, the, uh, the, if I step back actually in this build, um, so this is sort of the generic high performance VM picture. You have some bytecode which you interpret, you get statistics from the bytecode, 
you feed that, feed that through some level of uh, multiple levels of compilation. Each level of compilation generates some binary and maybe some more statistics. If something goes badly wrong, you deopt back to the interpreter and begin again. But you end up with a, uh, an optimized method and now no more way of generating statistics because you've, you've elided all the instrumentation code. So it's running really quickly, but is it really running as quickly as it could? How could you tell? You can't, really. And all the current implementations can, uh, can only make some level of inference from other data as to how, how well this final version is performing. And so the, the idea here is, can we turn on this trace recording mechanism, gather data, validate the assumptions made by the last compilation tier, and if we cannot validate them, if we find a contradiction in behavior between what's actually happening and what the compiler thought could happen, then we go back and re-optimize. So in effect adding another optimization tier, which requires gathering traces, doing some analysis, and, and re-invoking the last tier compiler to optimize further. And of course this has to be fast. Uh, we can't afford a 1500x slowdown in trace processing. We have to do things much more uh, efficiently than that. The current structure that we're envisaging is something like this. You know, in one fork, we've got a compiled method which we're executing and is being executed over and over again. In parallel with that, we pick some methods for tracing. Uh, we start gathering traces, and so data is feeding from the execution of the method over to the trace recorder and being put in memory. <coughs> We're doing some online analysis to condense these and summarize them because at 500 megabytes a second, you, you're going to fill up memory really quick if you have to keep them around. How many threads can you trace at once? Um, the hardware is such that there is a copy in every hardware context. core, every hardware context. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, or I can talk a little bit, uh, about how that's realized in the system software if we, if we have time. Um, um, okay, so two more sentences. So we feed that back into the, um, the, the analysis and the summary, and then um, having done an analysis, we can then make a decision as to whether we re-optimize or whether we're good. It's all out executing exactly as we, we envisage. Um, note that um, we think we can get data from the compilers and get the decoding much faster because it already knows the control flow structure when it's compiling, so we don't need to deduce that after the fact. And in reality, what we're doing here in the long term is extracting some kind of performance model from the compiler and comparing that with the actual performance and making decisions based on that. But we're a long way from that in our implementation. <clears throat> so in conclusion, uh, with this mechanism, you can record traces at low, ahead, at low overhead usable in the production system. The decoding is a little bit more challenging. We're adding recording, <laughs> decoding, and processing to, to Graal VM. Uh, first goal is to just feed this back to developers as a sort of a different form of profile. And the ultimate goal is to re-optimize our methods. And I forgot to mention I'm working with Chan Su, who's sitting right there, who's doing all the hard work, and I'll send all our questions to her. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a couple of months into this now and uh, moving on. So, I'll take any questions. Thank you. What's Intel's? Use case for this uh, It's not completely apparent from the sparse documentation and presentations that are available, but reading between the lines, I believe the first order <coughs> design was really a debugging aid. Okay. So the idea was, you know, you have a crash, maybe your stack is corrupt, you can't figure anything out, you just have a pile of bits. How did you how did you crash? This gives you a way of of knowing how you got to a specific place. That, I think, was what motivated it. There have been two generations of chips that implement this, Broadwell and now Skylake. If you have a Skylake laptop, you have the hardware to do this. If you have Broadwell, I'm not sure what was in laptops. But. Anyway, the Broadwell one is less feature complete and somewhat buggy, judging by the errata sheet. The Skylake one seems perfectly capable. Um, and now, uh, I think, as Intel gets more feedback, it's uh, it's enhanced the facility. For example, one thing I did not mention is um, in the traces, you can also get very high accuracy timestamps in the trace. 
the like nanosecond life of timestamps, which give you a very accurate replay of performance through the trace. And that was added in the Skylake implementation. Um, I think as they get more feedback from software people, they're enhancing this to do more things. Uh, there's a little bit of literature around this. Almost all of the literature is referenced in the abstract. So there are like only half a dozen papers out there and websites. Um, the, the, most of the academic literature is about using this for security to try and detect when a process has been compromised and has run off the rails and is being exploited through some vulnerability. Um, but you know, we shouldn't let all get ahead. Uh, let me come back to trace compilation. Do you think that would be feasible to, to figure out which trace uh, belongs to which optimized code in my with low overhead? The, the, the trick will be extracting the trace at high speed. So you probably have to write your own custom decoder and not rely on the built-in one. But I believe you can get certainly one order of magnitude, maybe two, by doing it carefully by hand. And if you can get hints from the execution system as to how to process the traces, then that helps too. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's a potential area of application. Now we don't do trace compilation, so we're not going down that path. But anyone who does should look at this really seriously. Can I just with the trace? Um, so I'm currently working on trying to map from the binary traces back to high-level open stores in the VM, mm -hmm. and that is already really hard. Mm -hmm. so, so we should talk about yeah. So what's what's so in Arbeit you have that black hole on top of the which does the tracing, right? It's not about the black hole itself. No, so but the, so the, the tracing itself is much much slower than the normal. Yes, it's like hundred times slower. So if you can get the hardware to do this for you, then yeah. brilliant. But the thing is, a lot of optimizations rely on the fact that you know that this uh, store is this high level variable, yeah. and that you're in this basic block. Right. And what one difficulty with the tracing scenario is that you don't have data, right? It's just control flow. Yeah. So if you rely on knowing the actual values that we're in, this is not going to help you. It's just giving you control flow. But I have one more question. Uh, so obviously it's very early stage, uh, but um, I'm trying to sort of build intuition on on what kinds of problems you uh, anticipate discovering through this tracing that would cause the you know the reoptimization of the of the code. So, to, so, so an example. So the kind of things I expect to get, and uh, kind of things we'll get from this, certainly, is branch profiles. Also, whether the so, branch so you'll you'll be able to see the profile of branches taken within a method. Uh, you can reconstruct path information. So if you have a hot loop and you want to find the most common path through the loop, you should be able to get that fairly straightforwardly. You can get uh, call histogram information for indirect calls, virtual calls, right? Because every indirect call is logged in this mechanism as well. It cannot be inferred from the binary. And with that data, we should be able to look at the assumptions that the compiler made about what was hot in the method, what paths were hot, and, and <coughs> tune those up. Um, so uh, code reordering. Um, optimizing, then finding the hot path or hot paths and optimizing those really well as opposed to guessing what's the hot path based on interpreted data or TL, TL1 compilation data. So, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but one idea would be that Ralph or you know, any other compiler can sometimes not decide whether both branches of the conditional should correct. be compiled into the, correct. the final binary or not. Correct. You could verify that. Yes. Basically, maybe yes. there was one execution that caused one yeah. branch to be taken and a million yes, the exactly. other branch taken. Exactly. And it will never happen again. The, and this the, would tell you that it yes. never happens the, again. The, the other interesting thing here is uh, if you hit a deoptimization, you know how you got there, right? If you capture the trace leading up to that, you know the past sequence of decisions that was taken leading cool. up to that deoptimization. And maybe you can you can make that not a really slow path for a a, a, a pre Cool. So one last question. And then coffee. You have to own the coffee, so one last question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think um, the process manufacturer that ARM might be available? ARM has an existing mechanism that is uh, actually most processor manufacturers have something that is what I would describe as a predecessor to this. Spark does too. Uh, and what those mechanisms do is they log very low level data into some kind of buffer 
for use by the hardware architects to find crashes during bring up. Uh, now, in, in ARM, there's a facility called CoreSight, which when you build a, a SES OC, you can pull in CoreSight blocks and put them on the chip, and it will log stuff to memory. But it's not as smart as this in that it logs the full address of every branch. It might be the full address of every instruction taken. So the data is just phenomenal, right? I mean, not hundreds of megabytes a second, but gigabytes a second. Um, Spark has a similar kind of capability, but it logs the data into the last level cache, which, it part, which you partition at boot time into a logging half and a non-logging half. And so you're limited by the size of that cache, and also you slowed your whole system down by halving your cache sounds. So the, the, there's a predecessor to all this in almost every chip, but it's really there for hardware level debugging, and Intel is sort of taking the next step and putting this thing that's capable of being used by system software. Um, you know, debugging is a perfectly good application of this, even for normal users, and it's already supported in GDB. If you've got the right machine, the right Linux uh, system, fire up GDB, you can look at the trace point. Thank you very much.